here they come, the 8-9 Combo Podcast. The good old mate to Brett McKay out of Oz. He was with the Royal Melbourne, now with Rugby Pass. And Harabaldi Jones, man of leisure and pleasure, worldwide icon. Welcome, gentlemen. G'day, mate. How are you? <laughs> How's it, Marty? How are you doing, pal? Um, last time we spoke, Haz, uh, we were in France and you were in a spa pool somewhere doing your podcast. I might tell you what, I salute you and I stand and applaud. Still still one of the most traumatic podcasts we recorded <laughs> through the World Cup for me, Martin, let me tell you. Oh, I thought it was brilliant. That's where every podcast we recorded. <laughs> look, your podcast is we genius, boys. We went from bars and brothels across the country. Oh, look, I'm loving it. It, yeah. was the, it was the gentle lapping of water that uh, did me. Everything through the whole, about it. The whole yeah. recording. We can edit this out, Lachlan. We can re- reverse and edit all of this out at the end of the day, even though it's live radio. Okay, the 8-9 podcast I'm absolutely <laughs> loving. And you came up with a suggestion which we wanted to debate today. It's called the Ghetto Law. It's about Matt, Matt Ghetto, ladies and gentlemen. And the way it worked is Australia rugby came through that you can get selected to play for the Wallabies overseas if you played, I think it was 60 tests. Now, this is especially relevant to New Zealand. We have this argument all the time. But just outline the case, boys. Why do you want this law scrapped? Why do you want it so that if Wallabies go overseas, you can be selected to play for the Wallabies from wherever? Yeah, well, I don't know if Brett actually supports that, you know, and he's a nine on the eight. Uh, we, we like to say that the nine is a detailist and the eight is a half narcissist. So he's going to get down into the details of, uh, of the spreadsheet of this. But what I say, Marty, is international players adapt to the modern international game best. Uh, the Wallabies don't have the depth locally to compete and the way they're trying to compete without uh, the influx of overseas players. You need more than just the top three, the top four. It's hard to guess which three will be in best form. What I say is get the best 10 or so overseas players, bring them into the squad, have them compete, and then you can pick the ones on form because the best 10 overseas Australian players are definitely better than the worst 10 in the camp right now. I'm not saying that they're all better than the ones who are the best, but you've got to have squad depth to compete in World Cups against the Lions, and against rugby championships and to get the bladder slow to become more suspenseful again. All right. What do you got, Brett? <laughs> it's it's a really interesting one, this one, Marty. And I'm I'm really agonizing over this at the moment because all the points that Harry makes is actually is actually quite good. What sits in the back of my mind about all this is it, is that if if the if the rule or if the allowance is scrapped completely and, and already there's been there's been a general general uh, watering down over it over the years anyway. So Dave Rennie, I think, had it down to maybe th- – well, and Eddie Jones, I think, had it down to uh, maybe 30 tests, something like that. And then he got an allowance that he could basically pick whoever he needed for the World Cup. There's reports that maybe Joe Schmidt might have got it further than that and it might just be, be open slather. I'm not sure that we can quite afford to go completely open slather. And all the points Harry makes about depth is really good, but it's also a little bit illustrative because if you, if we make it open slather and therefore if you are eligible to play for the Wallabies, you can be picked from wherever you are playing. My big concern in this is not so much that the, the top 15 players in each Super Rugby team will go, but it'll be players, you know, 16 to 25. And they're probably the guys that Australian rugby can least afford to lose because the guys that are outside the top 25 in those five squads, they're not yet ready for, for Super Rugby regularly. And so I, I think that the the long-term pain, or the, I think the, the short-term gains will be much more heavily felt in the long-term when suddenly... You know, we are literally picking blokes out of Brisbane and Canberra and Sydney and Melbourne and Perth club rugby with, you know, no super rugby experience to suddenly sit on a bench in, you know, in early March to fill spots. And I'm not sure that we've got the general playing depth to be able to do that yet. Okay. But as I say, I'm agonising over this because Harry makes some really good points. All right, so here in New Zealand, we've got a different set of circumstances, people, because we always pride ourselves on having a, a lot more depth. Uh, but the same debate is actually happening. I'd argue also, Harry, that... Look, I don't know if Super Rugby at the moment is adequate preparation, and 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 also the and also the sidebar that I'll put on that. Sorry, is simply that South Africa has proved successive World Cups that they can survive with players playing overseas. So this also puts cat and monks pigeons for the rest, doesn't it? Because if South Africa can do it here in New Zealand, we're thinking, well, why can't we do it? I do understand the Harry what Brett's saying because the playing depth isn't there with Australia. 
You know, I, so I think here's the thing, you know, Australia's looking around and saying, who should we copy? You know, and we keep talking about mm. Ireland, Ireland, Irish. And Australia has a lot of Irish people running around on, by heritage, but it's a lot less like Ireland in sport than Aussies think. Ireland is a tiny little country with everything uh, centered on, on Leinster, on Dublin. Do you know that they have 13 central contracts in Ireland rugby right now, and 10 of them are for Leinster? And these are not top-ups. These are full paid. So, uh, so Leinster does not pay those salaries. Also, you know, Ireland picks overseas players that just take away Kiwis. <laughs> they take yeah, Davis and Gibson Park and Dave Lowe and guys like that. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they pick him for 10 years. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and so the, when, you, when, you, when you have Australia or New Zealand able to pick overseas players, you can let the guy get better like uh, Matt Canson or Manny Miafu over at Toulouse and then pick him anyway. And right now mm-hmm. you have to watch the guy get better overseas and then, you know, he's suddenly Manny Miafu's smashing Maro Etoje and you're thinking, but that's a guy from mm-hmm. Melbourne. Why is he playing for France? So I do think that the new age is, is different. I, I don't know what Razor's is going to do. I would imagine Razor wants to have Ari Sauvé and Reggie Mulga back. But uh, the thing is, I think it's difficult to copy Ireland. It's a strange, the tax regimen's different. It's a small island. It's it's a rich place. So people want to move there. A lot of young players move there. The top-ups are next level. And it's it's just a difficult thing to, to copy. So I'm worried that Australia mm. is trying to do that and it won't be able to pull off exactly how Irish rugby works. Okay, the other thing is, Brett, a, is a that, of- sorry, is that, is that, you know, in, you know, we have to also understand that in, in Australia, super rugby really is struggling and is battling against those other sports. You've got AFL, you've yeah. also got NRL, which takes your top athletes. And so rugby picks, because it's private school, it picks from the rest, doesn't it? Yeah, ab- absolutely. And, and that's a, and that's an advantage that Ireland and South Africa have as well. They haven't quite got the. They've got other sports, and 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 there's probably an argument that 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 rugby in Ireland is, you know, number two at best, and maybe even number three in, in terms of the football codes. But, you know, the the rugby pathways in Ireland are, are very strong. And the big difference that, and the big advantage that Ireland has, and South Africa as well, is that their players are playing a lot more rugby than than is the case in Australia. And even New Zealand has that advantage over. Over Australia, we don't have a, a you know a, a proper third tier domestic competition at the moment. So yeah. as it stands right now, we're about to go into round nine of Super Rugby Pacific. There will be guys in state squads right now who are seven games away from going back to club rugby, and that's what they'll do for the last six months of 2024. Whereas in South Africa, there is Curry Cup to play. In New Zealand, there's yeah. an NPC to come up later this year. Yeah. You know, obviously, if you're playing in Europe, they're playing you know, 15 or 18 rounds of the URC or the premiership. And, um, and, and then there's European rounds as well to go as well. So the big problem we have in Australia is that we, we, on one hand, we don't have enough depth, but on the other hand, we're not playing enough rugby to be able to build that depth. And so we're, we're, we're actually getting further behind because we can't even keep, um, you know, keep on par with the amount of rugby that's being played. I've often used the examples of Noel Olaseal and, um, and Marcus Smith as a bit of a comparison. Those two guys are about, they're very, very similar age. They made their first class taboos within about, within about four or five months of each other. But at the point at the point that they are right now, and you know, Noel Olaseo has played, I think, 17 or 18 tests. He's just brought up his 50th Super Rugby game late last season, maybe early this season. Marcus Smith has already played 100 games for Harlequins, as well as his 10 right. tests for England. Okay. So he's played twice as much rugby as Noel Olaseo in the same time and at the same age. And that's a... That's a massive difference and a massive, advantage, a massive disadvantage that Australia have a, has against the rest of the world.